Hello, and welcome to the 55th episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Saturday, the 1st of November 2014, and I'm your host, Tom O'Brien. If you'd like to experience the joy of forcing other people to hear your name, why not click on that there donate button on the podcast website? This week, I am delighted to have Rick Rosoff, longtime anti war activist, all round NATO expert, and creator of the Stop NATO Opposition to Global Militarism blog. In a wide ranging interview, we discuss the current Ukraine situation, the big new Brzezinski and the Grand Chessboard, the NATO expansion and encirclement of Russia, and the plight of Syria. So, Rick. What is the origin of NATO? The North Atlantic Treaty Organization, whose uh, name is becoming increasingly uh, irrelevant, I would say, or inaccurate, a misnomer, uh, is a military bloc that was established by the United States in the spring of 1949 with 11 military allies in Europe, uh, North America, also Canada, was one of the founding members, and Iceland and the Atlantic Ocean, the small entity that it is, insular entity. And then, in addition to those three, uh, nine European nations, uh, almost entirely in Western or Northwestern Europe, Italy being the one exception, so that the Appalachian NATO was, at least in that sense, accurate. All the nations bordered or were in the North Atlantic Ocean, with the exception of Italy. Of course, it has been transformed in the interim into a uh, 28-nation military bloc, the uh, hefty majority of which members uh, are nowhere near the Atlantic Ocean. It was a a plan for the United States to permanently extend its military presence in Europe at the end of World War II, uh, which indeed has transpired. American military forces are still in, in Europe and farther to the east and farther to the southeast. Uh, as the years go by, uh, portrayed as a uh, military alliance to de- uh, deter alleged Soviet aggression in Europe. It is, in fact, uh, an act of military uh, aggression by the United States against the people of Europe. And how has their role evolved over time? It's evolved demonstrably and I would say demoniacally uh, since the end of the Cold War, particularly since the uh, fragmentation of the Soviet Union in 1991. Uh, which coincided, by the way, with the formal dissolution of uh, what was called the Warsaw Treaty Organization, itself set up six years after NATO in response to NATO absorbing West Germany into its uh, bloc. And immediately afterwards, the Soviet Union and its Eastern European allies set up the uh, Warsaw Treaty Organization, popularly known, commonly known as the Warsaw Pact. And that was, uh, even though moribund, for years preceding its formal uh, self-dissolution in 1991, that occurred too, so that uh, any argument for the continued existence of NATO uh, in 1991 had been uh, eliminated as not only did the Warsaw Pact not exist any longer, but the Soviet Union didn't exist any longer. Nevertheless, the U.S. seized that opportunity, the opportunity that is of uh, no challenge and you know no one to counteract them in, uh, in Europe, to far from dissolving NATO, uh, reinvigorating and expanding it. And immediately, almost immediately afterwards, 1994, on the instigation of the United States, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and developed a number of so-called partnership programs, which they had never had in the past, uh, to include countries throughout the Mediterranean Sea and North Africa and Middle East, throughout the entirety of Europe, uh, into the South Caucasus, to Central Asia, all the, all the way to the Chinese border, in the case of Kazakhstan, a process which uh, has continued relentlessly in the interim so that uh, NATO currently has, in addition to 28 full members, and that uh, that increase, by the way, between 19, in the decade between 1999 and 2009, 12 new members, all in Eastern Europe, are added as full members to NATO, which represents a 75% increase in its membership. But in addition to those 28 full NATO member states currently, there are at least 40, and, and perhaps uh, even more, uh, NATO partnership states so that NATO's members and partners, allies and partners, constitute well over a third of the countries in the world. This is a transformation that's occurred in the post-Cold War era. So I remember seeing an interview, I think, with Gore Vidal and Noam Chomsky, where they were talking about the Cold War and 
Chomsky, I remember saying, saw the Cold War as really, it had nothing to do with, say, that they were Soviet or that they were dictatorial. It was just different power blocks, the old imperial game at play. Is this your analysis of the Cold War? Well, the Cold War, it, it's something uh, many of your listeners uh, have lived through. I've lived through it. Uh, in the very beginning of the Cold War, the, it struck my family where, uh, as an infant, I was deported from the country with my mother during the Cold War. I had my paternal grandmother terrorized by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, both incidents in Youngstown, Ohio, my hometown. We you know, lived in constant terror of nuclear annihilation. We had atomic uh, weapons drills in school, you know, it was a, an atmosphere, you know, what was oftentimes referred to as the balance of terror, you know, the, with the nuclear arsenals of the United States and the Soviet Union. So it, it, it was a period that uh, the world was so glad to be rid of, I fear, that in 1987, with the uh, Gorbachev administration and the Soviet Union essentially capitulating to the West on a number of issues, uh, being assured, incidentally, that NATO would not move one inch eastward, if you recollect, uh, particularly by Secretary of State James Baker at the time, to the Gorbachev Shevardnadze uh, uh, crew, Shevardnadze being the last foreign minister of the Soviet Union, that uh, everyone was so ecstatic about the end of the Cold War that I think they forgot to look uh, in what manner it ended, which was a um, unilateral decisive victory, uh, fraught as it was with unparalleled triumphalism on behalf of the putative victor, the United States, and that, um, you know, far from this issuing in an era of peace, it uh, issued in a continuous, seamless, uh, escalating uh, series of wars between 1991 and the present day, to the point where even uh, Pope Francis I a few weeks ago referred to piecemeal world war as a way of describing the you know the post Cold War situation. That's a very accurate summation. Who was uh, the big new Brzezinski, and can you tell us about his uh, important book he wrote in the late 90s, The Grand Chessboard? We are living, if you will in a world politic that was crafted by more than anyone else, uh, precisely Zbigniew Brzezinski. Polish-born, former national security advisor during the uh, Jimmy Carter administration from 1977 to 1981, one who, uh, you know, by some accounts, I mentioned it in a recent talk, has been accused, I think, with, with a good deal of justification of having engineered the debacle that is the, the attempted rescue of American hostages in Tehran, Iran, and the embassy towards the end of the Carter days that resulted in the uh, uh, Secretary of State Cyrus Vance being discredited and deposed. So that what you're talking about is the transitional Carter administration, foreign policy being run effectively by Zbigniew Brzezinski. He um, is a, an arch Russophobe. Uh, no doubt uh, just as uh, virulently anti-communist, but had no problem at all uh, reaching a, a veritable strategic alliance with China under Deng Xiaoping, and even being instrumental, I, I think it could be argued with, you know, without any fear of contradiction, you know, working hand in glove with China in such places as, as and against uh, Cambodia, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Angola. Ethiopia and other countries where the U.S. worked in conjunction with pro-Chinese elements at that time against uh, pro-Soviet uh, governments. Uh, the invasion of Vietnam that occurred in early 1979 occurred shortly after Deng Xiaoping, who was the first communist Chinese head of state to visit the United States, uh, met secretly with Zbigniew Brzezinski, uh, Richard Holbrook, even Richard Nixon, I understand, earlier that year. And soon after his return home, uh, China invaded Vietnam. So this is the sort of fellow Brzezinski is. The uh, uh, Nixon-Kissinger regime had uh, solidified uh, what could arguably be uh, described as uh, not a detente, but entente, entente cordiale, actually, with China during, you know, with Nixon and Kissinger's trips to Beijing. But the Brzezinski-Carter administration solidified that relationship yet further. Uh, Brzezinski also was the one who uh, switched uh, the loyalties of the government of Somalia, Siad Bar, right? Mohammed Siad Bar, uh, from a pro-Soviet to a pro-U.S. situation, backed Somalia's invasion of the Agadan Desert uh, in its subsequent war with uh, Ethiopia, and, and one by one was picking off countries formerly allied with the Soviet Union. His biggest acquisition, arguably, was Egypt with the Camp David Accords, where he won over the Egyptian government to a pro-U.S. position with the expulsion of Soviet military and other personnel. So he's, he's somebody who has defined the world uh, as it currently is, in my estimate, more than anybody else alive. Uh, the book you allude to, The Grand Chessboard, 
is uh, his blueprint, if you will, uh, for the U.S. to develop and to maintain uncontested global domination, uncontested, unparalleled global domination for 20 years, I believe, is his estimate at that time, and what is necessary to do to, to ensure that. And, and what was the strategy he put forward then? Well, there are several of them, but uh, the major one was he argued that uh, something he referred to as the Eurasian Balkans, uh, you know, stretch of land from perhaps Southeast Asia all the way to the Chinese border, Kazakhstan, was, uh, if, I don't know if he used the word exactly volatile, but certainly strategic. He was essentially using uh, Helford Mackinder, the British geographer's heartland theory, that says that he who controls, you know, Eastern Europe controls the Eurasian heartland, he who controls the Eurasian heartland controls the world. And what Brzezinski was talking about was that area that roughly could be defined, I would guess, from the Balkans to uh, you know, Kazakhstan as being an area that if the U.S. could do- move into and dominate would prevent any other regional power from contesting U.S. interest regionally or, or globally. Meaning that uh, he actually defined the U.S. at that time, and to this day, uh, the same situation obtains, as the world's first uncontested uh, super war, uh, superpower. And that's, you know, in fact the case. He then itemizes four ways in which the U.S. is uh, the superpower militarily, of course, uh, financially or economically is another, technologically is a third. And fourth, and I think it's very revealing, he places in parentheses, as I recollect the words, whatever one thinks of it culture, and by which he meant the substandard U.S. commercial pop culture that dominates the world as much as anything else does. Why does he see that area of Eastern Europe or Central Asia so important? What is so strategically important about it? Well, I'm going to speak in my own voice now, you know, rather than Brzezinski. To be frank with you, it's been quite a while since I've read the book. But I, I think that what we can all generally acknowledge is that in the post-Cold War period, the major source of petrochemicals for the world were the former Soviet Union and the Persian Gulf. Uh, you know, there's, there's also oil, of course, in Venezuela, Canada, the uh, Gulf of Guinea in West Africa. The U.S. gets a large percentage of its fairly high-grade crude oil from uh, Nigeria and, and Angola and intends to get yet more. But uh, what happened at the end of the Cold War was the entire globe was open up to U.S. penetration and exploitation, many parts of which had been off-limits to the United States prior to that. And the Caspian Sea is one of the key ones. Uh, there are five literal states. Four of them are former Soviet republics. Iran is the only, you know, uh, Caspian state sea that was not part of the Soviet Union. But uh, Russia is one of them. Uh, Kazakhstan, Turkestan, and Azerbaijan are the other three. And the U.S. immediately insinuated itself into the Caspian Sea to the point where later, during the George W. Bush administration, then uh, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld was openly talking about uh, instituting a Caspian Guard that is a U.S. military naval presence in the Caspian Sea. Of course, Russia and Iran could not abide that, and it didn't materialize, but not for uh, lack of intent. What the U.S. went to work with immediately is something that was at one point called the uh, deal of the century, or words to that effect, with Azerbaijan, which is a South Caucasus country that borders the western uh, part of the Caspian Sea to line up uh, Caspian Sea oil natural gas to be shipped across the South Caucasus, circumventing Russia and Iran into Europe. The European Union, especially, especially now in its expanded format since 1999, is uh, collectively, aggregately, the second largest consumer of oil and natural gas in the world, second uh, next to the United States. So to uh, monopolize uh, the provision of uh, oil and gas to the European Union is a major geograph- uh, geopolitical and geostrategic and historical you know, objective, and the U.S. is, is hell-bent on doing that. So controlling that area is a vital part of it. We also know, of course, that it's basically in the area of Central Asia where the three major land powers in, in Asia that are not, uh, three major land powers in the world that are not subordinate to U.S. interest, you know, excluding, of course, the ALBA, Bolivarian Alliance of the Peoples of Our America, uh, countries in Latin America, that are independent of the U.S. orbit, uh, you know, converge in their interests. Those countries are Russia, China, and Iran, and potentially at some point India. And to, uh, uh, again, plant the U.S. and NATO military presence in that area is an effective way of preventing the coalescence of those uh, Eurasian countries into some bloc as the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or the BRICS alliance, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, 
uh, South Africa and so forth, you know, would suggest as models. So the U.S. was looking ahead and, and being sure, in, in Brzezinski's words, to uh, ensure again that no country or a combination of countries arises to prevent any challenge to the United States, that Central Asia and uh, that whole area from the Balkans, you know, the, to the eastern part of Central Asia is a, a critical area for the United States to control. Uh, a socialized and negotiated situation. A socialized and negotiated situation. A socialized and negotiated situation. Then cut them off. Refuse to socialize, take the negotiate. Over. Refuse the situation, cut them off. Take over. Refuse to socialize, take the cut them off. Take over. Refuse the situation, take them off. So I'm uh, sitting here in the UK and you know, the UK is quite chock a block with US bases and so is most of a lot of Western Europe. We don't seem to have the same kind of idea that we're under the Americans boot so much as say when we look to US bases say in the Middle East. What, why, why is it that we don't see it, the common man see it in the same way? Uh, we were arguing about, I mean, we were talking rather about Brzezinski's, uh, you know, quadripartite definition of U.S. Uh, global dominance and the fact that he suggested American culture, which, uh, you know, even he has uh, enough contempt for to, uh, you know, make the parenthetical statement I, I mentioned that, you know, in large part, we're not talking about people who have been persuaded through rational discourse to adopt a political perspective that is, uh, you know, supportive of the United States so much as we're talking about politicians who have been bribed and suborned. We're talking about populaces that have been depoliticized through uh, not only narcissistic but almost solipsistic uh, so-called, you know, we're talking about a misnomer, uh, social networking and and media and such like. So that we're talking about people who don't know what's going on under their own nose in, too, in far too many instances. So if there's a military base, as in, uh, you know, if hundreds of thousands of NATO troops are going through Shannon Air Base or Airport in Ireland uh, en route to wars in the East, East, people uh, aren't as aware of such or aren't as concerned about such events as I, I believe they would have been 30 or 40 years ago. That's one factor. We have, to, we, can, we have to acknowledge that. Second of all, there has been a steady, in the words of the State Department several years ago, a push to the East and the South. And that's what we've seen in the post-Cold War period. When I mention parts of the world that were off base to the United States during the Cold War, let's talk about countries that now have military install, U.S. and NATO military installations. Said. Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, Kosovo, you know, Serbia, Jordan, Kuwait, Bahrain, Afghanistan up until recently, Iraq, uh, Kyrgyzstan until recently. Uh, there's a NATO base, a French NATO, ba- uh, a French base rather in Tajikistan. There's a German base in Uzbekistan. We go all the way down the line. These are in, in Africa. A similar situation uh, exists where there are U.S. and other military installations in, in at least a dozen, perhaps two dozen countries that did not and could not have did not exist and could not have existed during the Cold War. So what you're seeing in a way is what's uh, it's known by the acronym base closing and relocation, if I've got it right. Or, uh, I, I, I'm a little bit wrong on that. But in the post-Cold War period, the U.S. reduced the preponderance of its f- military personnel in Europe, simply brought them home and redeployed them elsewhere in many instances. And there's less and less need uh, for troops. And you know, and the U.S. did, uh, according to report at least, you know, remove the tactical nuclear weapons in Britain that were there under what's called the NATO burden sharing uh, or, or nuclear sharing arrangement. However, those tactical nuclear weapons remain in Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Italy, and Turkey. Turkey is a country that is, um, of course, borders Iran, Syria, and Iraq. And it has U.S. tactical nuclear weapons uh, there under a NATO uh, program. By the way, the uh, burden sharing means the warplanes, the bomber planes of the respective countries are the ones that uh, will drop the nuclear weapons. The uh, B-61 uh, tactical nuclear weapons are American, but the planes that deliver them are those from the respective uh, host countries. It, it, yeah, it just surprises me that when I hear you talk about this, it, it feels like it's it's ob- so obviously uh, an, an old colonial power. But it, it's it's so in our experience in the West, it's it's so soft on us that we don't that we like the common man doesn't really in, envisage it in that way. You know, that's really a shame. It truly is. The fact that uh, I mentioned the Republic of Ireland earlier, you know, that hundreds of thousands of foreign troops, 
have, have uh, transited that country to kill and die around the world, you know, in campaigns that I'm sure the overwhelming majority of Irish people oppose, and that this is permitted to go on because people either don't know about it or don't care about it, is, is, is an indictment of the current uh, moral as well as political standing globally. Let's let's take for example, and this this is an instance that really cries to the heavens for notice and certainly for redress. But for the last decade or so, several hundred troops of the nations of Sweden and Finland have served in four provinces in northern Afghanistan under NATO, under the North Atlantic Treaty Organization's International S uh, Security Assistance Force as have, by the way, the military forces of over 50 countries. Those hundreds of troops, I think it's 500 uh, Swedish and 200 Finnish, have engaged in active combat operations. They have killed and been killed. In the case of Finland, it's a first combat operation since World War II. And in the case of Sweden, the first uh, combat operations in 200 years. And that there have been transformations in the in the military in those alleged neutral countries that are still members of what is called Partnership for Peace, which was a major partnership program set up in 1994, I alluded to earlier. Uh, that program, Partnership for Peace, was used to uh, cultivate the 12 new countries that joined NATO and Eastern Europe between 1999 and 2009, but also includes the Republic of Ireland, Switzerland, Sweden, Finland, Austria, and now uh, all the uh, non-NATO members to date in uh, Southeast uh, Europe, particularly former uh, Yugoslav and, and uh, Soviet republics, uh, as well as Malta and Cyprus and the Mediterranean Sea. So that, as I've had occasion to, to point out before, the entirety of Europe, the entirety of Europe except for Russia, consists of nations that are either full members of NATO or NATO partners uh, of various gradations. And in some cases are members of several NATO partnership programs, including the Membership Action Program, which is the next to the last program before a country becomes a full member of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. You know, it would seem to me, I mean, I'm living in Chicago, and this to me is one of the most significant, if not the most significant fact, uh, over the 30, uh, last 30 years. You know, I have no idea why Europeans aren't concerned about this. I truthfully do not. Yeah, I would say from my own personal experience in Ireland, people are very aware of troops coming through Shannon and there was quite a bit of protest over that. But it, it seemed like something that was they were powerless to stop because of political decisions made at a, at a high level. But certainly I wouldn't have been aware that Ireland were involved in the Partnership for Peace programme. A small contingent of Irish troops have served under, has served under NATO in Afghanistan. So that's quite surprising to me as an Irish person because, because you know, Ireland have uh, this idea of being a neutral country. Uh, you know, there's no neutrality in Europe and there has not been since 1991. Let's establish that very quickly. There is no neutrality in Europe. You are with the United States, the Pentagon and NATO, or you, your government will be toppled. That is what we have learned since the 1990s. And if, as in the case of the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, you don't get in line, then you're torn apart, bombed and destroyed. And if... Uh, in nations like uh, Belarus or Moldova under the uh, former uh, government, that is that before 2009, the so-called Twitter revolution, you're only 50% or 75% cooperating with the United States and NATO, then you're targeted for, uh, for overthrow. If, as in Cyprus, you refuse to join the Partnership for Peace program, then the U.S. conspires behind the back of the then ruling party, Akel, brings about a coalescence of all the opposition parties, defeats the, uh, the uh, incumbent government, and announces immediately it's joining NATO's Partnership for Peace program. If in the tiny Mediterranean uh, nation of Malta, you, you elect a left-wing government that withdraws from the Partnership for Peace, the first and only time any nation has withdrawn from NATO or any NATO program, and as soon as then the U.S. and its NATO and European Union allies go to work to uh, unseat that government, put in a right-wing government, and guess what? Malta's back in Partnership for Peace. You do not leave. You do not escape the clutches of the United States and, and the Pentagon as long as NATO exists. And the entire European continent is subservient to the United States in terms of broader uh, international geopolitics as long as NATO exists. So I was wondering if we could speak then about the colour revolutions that have swept through Eastern Europe and also the current situation in Ukraine and put them into context about how this is a pattern. 
It is a, a discernible pattern. It's an irreputable pattern, and it's a pattern that has several, you know, different uh, aspects of significance. I would argue. First of all, the color revolutions, which were modeled after, if if you will, something preceding it, but uh, the true model, which was that in the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia in the autumn of two thousand, and it became the, the prototype model in that it uh, the color revolutions initially occurred against a backdrop of federal elections, particularly presidential elections. And a president would be in power who had been willing to cooperate with the United States. In every instance I'm going to mention, had cooperated with the United States, but that wasn't good enough. His time had come, and it was time to depose him. And in many instances, you know, these people, uh, you know, uh, like Slobodan Milosevic in, in Yugoslavia, you know, perished in a prison cell in, in the Netherlands uh, because the United States and its allies refused to allow him to go to Russia for medical treatment though Russia stood guarantor of his, you know, return for the trial in The Hague. But uh, the actual, the first formal color revolution, if you will, was in the uh, winter of 2003 in Georgia, when the incumbent president, the, the aforementioned uh, Edvard Shevardnadze, the, the last foreign minister of the Soviet Union, one who, you know, gave the U.S. everything it could possibly have asked. He withdrew Soviet troops from Afghanistan. He, uh, you know, gave up the entirety of Eastern Europe to uh, to the European Union, NATO, as well as the U.S. and what have you. But he ran, ran for re-election, one according to the standards uh, prevalent. The U.S. and company contested that on behalf of, uh, you know, a firebrand, uh, mercurial, uh, I would argue, maniacal uh, Mikhail Saakashvili, who had been educated in the United States. He's a graduate of Columbia University. He had practiced law in New York City. He had a foreign wife, a Dutch wife. Then staged what was really a violent you know, overthrow of the government. There's a scene um, some of your listeners may may have seen, it's on YouTube if you want to see it, from the end of 2003, December, where a bunch of young thugs, I can't describe them otherwise, go up and grab the, you know, aging Shevardnadze and, you know, basically, uh, you know, muscle him off the podium uh, as he's uh, trying to re reassume the mantle of president of the country. That's the first. The following year, then, a similar situation occurs. Uh, the This was the Rose Revolution in Georgia. In 2004 and early 2005, an Orange Revolution. By the way, the names have been designed evidently by some public relations firm in the West, most likely New York, because the, the Orange Revolution was uh, originally the Chestnut Revolution, and apparently they must have had a um, sample audience to decide on, on the uh, uh, which was uh, which title was preferable, so it became Orange Revolution. The following year, uh, the U.S. accelerated this and moved it outside of Europe with two rev so-called revolutions in March and May of 2005, in March in Kyrgyzstan, the Tulip Revolution, in May in Lebanon, the Cedar Revolution. And uh, by some accounts, it's open to interpretation, but it was attempting to replicate that in Uzbekistan in that year. And uh, then the, the only other successful color revolution, I would argue, was in 2009 in Moldova with the so-called Twitter revolution, which overthrew the uh, government of, of Vladimir Voronin and his Communist Party. It was the only former Soviet Republic whose ruling party uh, referred to itself as communist. And they had collaborated with the United States. They had sent troops to Iraq. They had uh, cooperated in many other ways. All these governments had, by the way. It's not as though these are governments hostile to the United States. The uh, government in Kyrgyzstan had allowed the Manus Air Base to be used as a major transit center for U.S. and NATO troops in and out of Afghanistan and surrounding countries. Uh, that didn't prevent their president from being overthrown in March of 2005. So the color revolutions are, uh, I would argue, the second generation uh, post-Soviet political uh, uh, transformations, you know, the first being the breakup of the Soviet Union into its 15 federal republics, and the second, the U.S. going in and kind of cleaning out even the remnants uh, of the Soviet Union. However, when you listen to the countries I mentioned, three of them are you know, Georgia, Ukraine, and Moldova, are three quarters of the nations, uh, the first letters of which lend themselves to the acronym GUAM, G-U-A-M. This is an initiative by the United States, Clinton administration in 1996, to link those four countries together as transit routes for, again, to revert to a point, for Caspian Sea oil and natural gas, it would be brought from as far east as Kazakhstan, a nation that borders both China and Russia, either under the Caspian Sea, as uh, the U.S. intended at one point through pipeline, or crossed it on, on tankers to uh, Azerbaijan and now probably Azerbaijan, Turkmenistan, and then from there across the Caucasus to Turkey and the Eastern Mediterranean, and from there to the world, uh, and that these countries are going to be used as transit countries. 
the fact that three of those uh, four countries have suffered, uh, experienced uh, color revolutions, and attempts have been made in the fourth, Azerbaijan, uh, suggests the U.S. had plans to, uh, you know, to, to use them not only as energy transit nations, bringing oil, natural gas from east to west, but as a former U.S. State Department operative, Ma Matthew Bryza, uh, revealed several years ago, this is precisely the same transit route that uh, was reversed to bring NATO troops from Europe into Afghanistan. In my solitude, you haunt me with reveries of days gone by. In my solitude. So the way you talk about all of these things, it, it seems like all of these presidents that are put into place in a lot of these different countries, they all have a very strong American connection. But of course, there's only one game in town. You know, I, I'm, I'm not speaking cynically. That's not my set of values, of course. Uh, but to somebody who simply exists uh, for self-aggrandizement or who fears to step down for fear what's going to happen to him if he does. But we do have to note the presidents for life tendency in, in uh, the non-European part and even parts of the uh, European uh, former Soviet uh, space. So that, you know, the five um, Central Asian former Soviet federal republics all have presidents for life. The one in Kyrgyzstan was overthrown. His successor was overthrown shortly thereafter. And in Turkmenistan, uh, you know, the first post-Soviet president, the only president, I suppose, but president of the uh, uh, post-Soviet Turkmenistan died in office. But in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, you still have the same person uh, in place since 1991. And in Azerbaijan, you have the son of the person who was, uh, you know, the president for life uh, after 1991. So there's a tendency for leaders in the former Soviet republics to cling to power. And if to do that, then they oriented orient towards the big power from which they, uh, you know, they wrest concessions or at least they they get uh, are spared, uh, you know, a color revolution. That's the United States, and indeed we've seen you know the presidents of uh, Kazakhstan, even Uzbekistan, which had been run afoul of the United States after the events of 2005 in the spring, has now uh, subordinated itself again to American interests. Uh, Hillary Clinton was there in the last couple of years. So why are they so interested in Ukraine then? The Ukraine is vital for a number of reasons. It's the second most populous of the 15 former Soviet federal republics next to Russia itself. It has, uh, you know, uh, dozens of nuclear reactors. It is the second most important uh, defense manufacturer, you know, uh, manufacturer of military uh, hardware. Uh, in the Soviet Union, next, uh, former Soviet Union, uh, next to Russia again. So uh, its capacities, its location, I, I, I believe, are, you know, we're talking pretty reductionist uh, geopolitics here. We're not talking about politics as we would like to define them internationally. We're talking about politics as they're conducted by the world's sole military superpower. That uh, title is uh, Barack Obama's to describe on the occasion of his receiving the Nobel Peace Prize five years ago. That's uh, the term he used to describe the country of, of which he is commander in chief, world's sole military superpower. So he's been reading his Brzezinski. Um, which isn't surprising considering he was a student at Columbia University at the time Brzezinski was on staff there. And it's uh, very difficult for me to imagine the two of them never got together and talked politics. So that uh, the world's whole su su military superpower cannot tolerate, cannot abide, 
the fact that any country could be even partially neutral. I mean, I have to be perfectly frank about that. If the, uh, you know, the crude expression, you're either with us or against us, ever had any applicability, it's in the post-Cold War period vis-a-vis -vis the United States. And we have to remember that Ukraine was, uh, through successive administrations, going back to the first head of state, of Kravchuk, then Kuzma, then Yushchenko, now uh, then Yanukovych, and now Poroshenko, has given the U.S. militarily pretty much what it wanted. Uh, it's get, given the U.S. a semi-official permanent naval presence in in, in the Crimea un, until recently with uh, annual sea breeze military exercises conducted by the U.S. and its NATO allies in that area. It's given uh, the uh, Kuzma government, that is three removed from the current Poroshenko one, deploy, gave the U.S. as many as a thousand troops to be deployed in Iraq uh, as part of its NATO uh, agreement in partnership for peace agreement. After the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the, even the Yanukovych government, uh, now uh, lambasted or criticized by the United States, nevertheless became the first non-NATO country to supply a warship, a naval vessel, for NATO's permanent uh, Mediterranean um, surveillance and interdiction operation, Operation Active Endeavor, became the first non-NATO country to supply a naval vessel for NATO's permanent Indian Ocean Horn of Africa, a naval uh, operation, Operation Ocean Shield. Uh, was to have been one and will uh, again be one of only four non-NATO countries that uh, were going to supply uh, personnel and equipment for the International NATO Response Force. This is all during the, uh, you know, the former Yanukovych government. So you can expect this to be accelerated yet more. And the fact is there was is some discussion about Ukraine perhaps joining the uh, former Eurasac or Custom Union with uh, Russia, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, and the U.S. couldn't tolerate that. So the fact was uh, crafted under a program called the Eastern Partnership, which was set up in 2009 on the instigation of Poland and Sweden, the European Union, working in cohorts as it always does with the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, crafted something called an association agreement uh, for these very uh, Guam countries we were talking about, Tom, uh, Moldova, Georgia, and Ukraine, and that uh, the Yanukovych government is simply demurring, you know, in uh, November, a year ago almost, uh, on the signing of that association agreement is what triggered the uprising in the capital city of Kiev, the ultimate overthrow of the government, and uh, the war that is now, I believe, almost 200 days old. And what was in this agreement that he was demurring on? What, would it, what did it mean for Ukraine? There was the economic carrot, of course, you know, trade and tariff and, and other benefits from joining. But there, there is, I mean, it's, it's online, by the way, uh, the, the association agreement, which has been signed in the interim by the Poroshenko government. Uh, it contains a very strong military component that uh, would lead yet further. Now, after everything I've told you about Ukraine's integration into NATO's Mediterranean naval operation into its Horn of Africa operation, having regular war games on its territory, on and on and on, this, again, is not sufficient. You're either completely with us or you're going to be destroyed. And that what the uh, association agreement stipulates in the security military sector is increased integration into European Union military structures. And, uh, you know, for the, many people on both sides of the Atlantic, unfortunately, have not only a benign, but, you know, arguably a delusional, an ostrich-like, struthious uh, misperception of the role of the European Union vis-a-vis -vis its foreign policy, but particularly its military policy. The European Union does have battle groups. The European Union is connected with NATO through something called the Berlin Plus Agreement of 1999 that permits uh, the European Union and NATO to overlap at, at virtually every point in terms of commanders, bases, military equipment, and, and so forth. I mentioned Operation Ocean Shield in the, off the Horn of Africa. There is a complementary European Union naval uh, operation, Operation Atalanta, the first ever in the history of the European Union, working, of course, hand in glove with NATO. The person who was in charge of that Operation at, uh, Atalanta until recently was uh, Sir Richard Sheriff who at the same, a British uh, commander, who at the time that he was uh, in charge of the European Union's naval operation in the Horn of Africa, was also Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. So there is essentially no difference between the European Union and NATO. As a matter of fact, the U.S., Washington, 
uses the European Union as the bait to trap nations into NATO and dictates in many instances which countries should join the European Union. But without European unions, apparently, the European Union leaders apparently, uh, you know, being the bit, uh, the slightest bit put off by this. I'm thinking of a former Secretary of State Colin Powell telling Brussels that Turkey should join the European Union, for example. What can you say about the, the Patricia Newland phone call that was released by the Russians? Who was Patricia Newland and what was she talking about? I'm not so sure it was intercepted by the Russians. I know that's, you know, the popular uh, interpretation and that allowed the State Department's spokesperson, you know, to get up there and say this is, uh, you know, the most egregious thing or the most criminal thing that's ever happened in human history or words to that effect. I'm not joking. We're, we're talking about Sakis, uh, the uh, sp- spokeswoman uh, for the State Department. Uh, you know, not the uh, statement made by Victoria Nolan, not what it implied, not what was occurring uh, in, in Ukraine. That wasn't, in her opinion, objectionable. But the fact that somebody may have intercepted and revealed it to the world, that was a crime. I mean, this is, you know, modern political morality in the 21st century. Victoria Newland is an American with a, a very lengthy history in the State Department, but it was also during the George W. Bush administration, the first term, if I'm not mistaken, but one of the two, was U.S. ambassador to NATO. He was permanent representative to NATO. She's the spouse of Robert Kagan, who's a think tank geopolitician. Uh, she is somebody who has maneuvered uh, in and out of successive Democratic and Republican uh, federal administrations with effortless ease, because that's all it's done here. In terms of foreign policy, at least, there's no distinction worth mentioning. And she was uh, uh, spoke with the U.S. ambassador to Kiev, uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Pyatt, and it only became noteworthy here again is how abased the political discourse has become in, in the modern world, thanks to the U.S.'s cultural dominance. It only became uh, uh, worthy of note because she used the expression F the EU, F the European Union. And that was in reference to a uh, good cop, bad cop arrangement between the NATO powers, where uh, France, Germany, and Poland sent their foreign ministers to Kiev ostensibly to negotiate with the Yanukovych government. I could only imagine. You know, if if, uh, Russia, China and Iran were to uh, send their foreign ministers to London to negotiate, uh, you know, the government stepping down in favor of a pro-Russian succession, pro-Russian force that uh, had not won any election, uh, you know, what the response would be. But this is exactly, you know, what had occurred in in Kiev. But Newland made the statement, the uh, used the expletive I alluded to. And it's that that uh, gained some notoriety for the conversation. But for that, nobody would have paid attention to it, sadly to say. But what she was giving orders to her, you know, again, she's in state, she's a State Department Under Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, meaning the ambassadors in uh, Europe and throughout Eurasia or her underlings, and Payet is one, and she was giving him marching orders. And she was telling him of the three uh, major uh, opposition leaders in the Ukraine at that time, who would occupy which position. That is, she was defining a post-coup Ukrainian junta that offended nobody, I should mention, right? Or maybe yourself, myself, a handful of people in the world. But of 7 billion people in the face of the earth, some people uh, had their attention uh, drawn uh, to her using a four-letter word. But aside from that, it was perfectly acceptable for the U.S. to uh, dictate a violent, bloody, lethal coup d'etat. We have to remember at least a dozen police officers were murdered in Kiev. And then, uh, you know, uh, scores of people murdered afterwards in the trade union hall in, in Odessa. All that was apparently... Uh, uh, part of the course, uh, but the, she made the mistake of using a word she perhaps ought not of, and that. Uh, but anyway, so that was a gift that permit, uh, permits us now to talk about this, whereas we might not have been able to before. She is the major engineer of the coup d'état, in uh, or at least the the one who ordered it uh, in its broad outlines, and Mr. Pyatt uh, followed her orders, and they toppled a legitimate government that had won a free election, recognized by I believe every country in the world, so inter- inter- internationally recognized. Legitimate legitimate government is overthrown by a bunch of street thugs on the orders of a a person in the U.S. State Department. And then immediately ensuing uh, is a war that began. It's called the anti-terrorist operation. I I suspect that very title was suggested by the United States, by the uh, junta in Kiev, which has been going on since April 15th. That is almost 200 days. And the person, though, that she was interested in nominating for the prime minister, I think, he subsequently became the prime minister. That's Arseny Yatsenyuk, yes. And we have to remember that in a country without a real government, the prime minister as being head of government uh, is effectively head of state. So, you know, until they could recruit or dragoon the billionaire 
chocolate manufacturer Petro Poroshenko into becoming the nominal or titular president, Yatsenyuk was running the government. So he occupied precisely the position that Newland indicated he would. So geopolitically, what, what has been the effect on this on Russia? It's been a tragic one. Uh, you know, the, the same uh, infamous Mr. Brzezinski, and it's a quote that surfaced a lot, uh, not surprisingly, in the last year, made a statement in the grand chessboard that, uh, you know, Russia with Ukraine is an empire. Could you imagine an American political uh, official having the temerity of using the word empire in reference to any other uh, country in the face of the earth now? But that Russia with Ukraine is an empire, without uh, Ukraine is not. Uh, let's translate that into sensible human language. That Russia with a friendly relation with its neighbor, of which, you know, they, they, the two of them constituted a common political entity for 400 years. They are not only close uh, linguistically, ethnically, religiously, culturally, in the broadest sense of the word, they were one country uh, until 1991, you know, going back to maybe the 17th century. And what the U.S. then is saying that with Ukraine as a partner, Russia essentially has a window to Europe. Without it, it does not. To bring a Ukraine entirely into the Western fold and make it antagonistic to Russia and use it as a pretext for the rapid and dangerous acceleration of military buildup by the U.S. and NATO from the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea, exactly what's occurred in the last six months. To do that is to effectively slam the last door on Russia vis-a-vis -vis Europe. If the energy strategy is to drive Russia out of the European energy market by either U.S. shale oil or Caspian Sea oil and natural gas, you know, coming into uh, to Europe in, in lieu of Russian uh, petrochemicals or hydrocarbons, then uh, turning Ukraine into a military outpost aimed at Russia is to effectively block off uh, Russia's Western egress entirely. And that's been affected. That is exactly what has been affected. So I, I read or saw somewhere that Russians have an awful lot of tactical short-range nuclear weapons that they can load and fire on artillery, like maybe 20 miles, 50 miles. And that recent aggression, say, or whatever we want to call it in the Ukraine and some of the Baltic states will force them maybe to push their nuclear weapons into a, a more active mode along their outer reaches. This sounds very dangerous if it's true. What's dangerous is that Russia has allowed the situation to get to this point where that may be their only alternative to defend themselves, incidentally, not just as some sort of preemptive attack. That uh, had the Russian government, and it's the same head of state now as it was then a decade ago, when NATO in the single largest um, episode of its expansion, that's at the Istanbul summit in Turkey in 2004, incorporated seven new nations at one time, all of them in Eastern Europe, three of them former Soviet republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, two of them staring Russia across in the Black Sea, Bulgaria and Romania, and immediately turned all, uh, virtually all of those countries into NATO military bases aimed incontestably and exclusively at Russia. The fact that Russia sat back for a decade, the Russian government sat back for a decade and permitted that to occur may have contributed in large part to the situation becoming irrevocable. That is that the U.S. is, is going to force Russia right now to either capitulate or retaliate. Well, what could they have done at that time to, to alter the course of events, say? There was an, an official in the uh, Russian Defense Department right at that time, and uh, uh, I'm talking about in 2004, and within days of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania being issued in as permanent members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the U.S. and its NATO allies started what they um, euphemistically referred to as air policing out of the Baltic states, out of an airport in Lithuania, which has now been augmented by a second airport in Estonia uh, with Latvia on its way. And this defense official said these warplanes, and these are you know fairly advanced generation multi-role combat aircraft, uh, or only a five-minute flight from Russia's second largest city of St. Petersburg and a 20-minute flight from the capital of Moscow. I can assure you that not only the United States but no uh, other European country would have permitted such a situation to develop. They would have diplomatically, economically, in whichever way they had to, including back channel, would have let it be known that this is not going to be tolerated and it would not have been. The problem is that as far as you know, the public record allows us to speculate that Russia has, during the course of the steady incontestable, you know, military buildup along its entire western flank uh, constantly speaks of its, uh, you know, esteemed NATO partners and valued and cherished colleagues and so forth. Can Russia pivot then their oil and their hydrocarbon exports to Asia and China? 
Yes, they can, and they are. I mean, yes, Russia can, and yes, Russia is. And that's, you know, to placate, uh, I suppose, you know, the uh, the oligarchs and the, the big corporations in Russia, it's, it's, it's going to keep them happy. Uh, in terms of the political battle for Europe, it's ceding the entire European continent to the United States. I mean, I, I, I don't think that can be argued. That just as, uh, you know, uh, young servicemen and service women from every single European country, except for the microstates, and maybe a couple of others have, uh, you know, dutifully served under NATO in Afghanistan. That is in a war, and this includes, you know, contingents of uh, small contingents of troops from Ireland, Switzerland, Sweden, Finland, Austria, and and such, you know, other countries. That uh, th- this has been permitted to go on. What it suggests is, you know, if Putin shifts eastward. Uh, which is sensible. I mean, uh, uh, BRICS and uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization are a lot more comfortable uh, formats uh, to be involved with than anything the you know the West has offered to Russia. Uh, it nevertheless allows the U.S. to once again uh, uh, claim a uh, you know perhaps a uh, unparalleled political victory, geopolitical victory, in resting the entire European and Caucasian former Soviet space from Russia and influence, destroying effectively, as I argued it would be done in an article of six and a half years ago, that the U.S.'s plan with the Eastern Partnership, of which the association agreement was the battering ram, uh, the plan was to dismantle and destroy the Commonwealth of Independent States, you know, the post-Soviet uh, trade and, and economic bloc, leaving Russia completely isolated within the former Soviet Union as well as in, in, in Europe, to destroy the Collective Security Treaty Organization, which is the only military uh, security formation that's evolved out of the former Soviet Union, and to uh, isolate Russia as it intends to isolate China and Iran, preparatory to either having them rot from within or being attacked from without or some combination of the two. I- NATO seems to be extremely interested in Russia and perhaps maybe not as interested in China. Is this because China is more integrated into the global production system than Russia? A couple of things. Russia, it's, you know, it's, it's unfortunate we have to talk about matters like this, but it would be irresponsible not to. Russia still has, at least on paper, nuclear parity with the United States. No other country is close to having it. That's the simple, the simple reductive fact of the matter. That China itself is susceptible to a massive U.S. military onslaught unless there's an understanding that Russia would object to that and be in a position to retaliate. That's my firmest conviction. And that if Russia is is through a combination of color revolution within, uh, maybe violent extremist activities to either splinter parts of the country or th- you know throw it off balance. At the same time, it's strangulated economically. Whatever the Western master plan is for Russia, but it includes fragmenting it. Of that, there's there's no question. That that would have to be accomplished first to leave China open 
and vulnerable to economic and, and political, but also military attack, to be perfectly blunt with you. Now, that does not prevent the, the so-called North Atlantic Treaty Organization from initiating uh, two and a half years ago, ahead of the NATO summit here in Chicago, uh, its, at that time, latest partnership program. And the first one that is not geographically specific, as its very title indicates, and the title is Partners Across the Globe, which uh, it, the initial installment of which is eight countries, all of them, in the Asia-Pacific region, the greater Asia-Pacific Asia region, they include South Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq. These countries are now full NATO partners. The uh, military of Afghanistan, which borders China, and the military of Iraq were trained under, respectively, the NATO training mission uh, Afghanistan and NATO training mission Iraq. South Korea is, uh, you know, and Japan is involved in uh, territorial disputes with both China and Russia. And that they are, uh, you know, uh, their head of state recently went to NATO headquarters, Abi. So it's, uh, it's, it's no question but that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is concentrating on Russia and Iran. In 2004, in addition to absorbing seven new members into NATO, they created a new partnership program called the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative which is to integrate the militaries of the six Asian, uh, the, the Persian Gulf uh, sheikdoms and the Gulf Cooperation Council with NATO, which has been done in, that, in the decade interim. So we're talking about a global military force. That's what I want to accentuate. When you asked at the beginning of this program, you know, what has happened to NATO in the interim since, uh, you know, the, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union, it has been transformed into a U.S.-dominated international expeditionary warfighting force. So since the Ukraine crisis over the last year or so, Putin's actions have made him extremely, extremely popular in Russia. I think his approval ratings are in the 80% or higher. So do we see the political support for a pushback against NATO's expansion coming from Russia I've been asked this question over the six, uh, last six months. You know, for example, uh, if NATO expands any further, what will Russia do? I say that question should have been asked 10 years ago. They are on the Russian border, right? You, you have, you know, during the Cold War, there was only one NATO nation that bordered Russia, and that at a very narrow strip. It was Norway. Now, in addition to Norway, you have a, it, bordering either the Russian mainland or the Kaliningrad, uh, you know, uh, exclave or oblast, you have Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and then NATO partners, Ukraine, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Finland, and uh, once again, Bulgaria and Romania across the Black Sea from Russia, and immediately, almost immediately after their joining NATO in 2004, the United States secured the acquisition and later uh, affected the upgrade of eight major military bases in Bulgaria and Romania, including naval bases in the Black Sea, including three major air bases. Now, guess who they're going to be used against? I can't think of any other conceivable adversary. So that, you know, uh, is there anti-NATO uh, sentiment rising in Russia? For God's sake, I hope so. You know, when Operation Barbarossa was launched against the Soviet Union in 1941, I should hope the Soviet people were opposed to Nazi Germany. The problem was they weren't uh, aware of the threat Nazi Germany presented to them six months earlier. That was a problem. What are the countervailing tendencies to this all-powerful U.S. NATO-led force? I say this because I'm looking at what the U.S. wishes were in, in Syria, and it seemed to me like that they weren't able to act there as how perhaps some of the establishment wanted. No, you're correct. And a major, uh, the Speaker of the um, Lower House of the Russian Parliament, the Duma, made a statement in early December of last year, almost a year ago, and it's very revealing. He said that Ukraine is payback for Syria to Russia, that the U.S. is, is now going to retaliate is, is, uh, you know, against Russia for having prevented their, uh, you know, through an unprecedented series of three joint vetoes in the United Nations Security Council with China, you know, preventing military activity against uh, Syria, that uh, Russia was going to be punished with Ukraine. And in fact, I think that's partially the case. So let's be clear about that. Now, what, uh, what does defeating U.S. geopolitics entail? The fact, you know, I have friends from Syria. I have friends who, you know, his family members have been victimized by uh, the U.S. freedom fighters, that is, you know, uh, armed mercenaries, foreign terrorists, uh, in many instances, that, you know, describe their entire village being depopulated or towns around them, you know, being all but depopulated. If victory means that a country is, for all intents and purposes, destroyed, uh, you know, ad, uh, in perpetuity, uh, 
that the you know the social fabric has been rent in such a way that it can't be put together again that uh, hundreds of thousands millions of people have been driven into exile never to return if you destroy a millennia old culture like that in Mesopotamia in Iraq and Syria then even victory is something we don't want right I mean, how much more uh, does Syria have to withstand? Russia could, I, in my estimate, you know, uh, I hate to paraphrase the infamous mass murderess, uh, Madeleine Albright, according to Colin Powell, when she turned on him at one point during the Bosnian crisis and said uh, the words that, as I recollect, and what do you have all those magnificent weapons for if you're not going to use them? You know, what does Russia have? You know, uh, strategic energy resources, uh, a military might that is second only to the United States and so forth and so on. Not if they're going to use it. I'm not suggesting the use of physical force, of violence. I'm against that. I'm against the taking of human life in any form. But if you're not going to, uh, you know, use what you have, then just give it up. You know, Russia it can do more than just prevent an attack against uh, Syria and then allow it to be destroyed by attrition. You know, if, if the situation had been reversed, this was a U.S. ally under an assault like that. I can assure you the U.S. would have intervened a lot more strenuously than Russia has in the case of Syria. But, at you know, at the end of the day, when Russia itself is thrown on the defensive and is under assault, then how much uh, assistance is it going to be able to continue to provide to Syria? That's another question. In the U.S., I've seen it displayed as a great victory for the for anti-war movement, being able to block the Syria thing. From from my point of view, looking at how it happened as well in the UK, it didn't seem to me that the anti-war people had changed it, but it seemed to me like that internal to the to the power the people in power that there was somewhat a reluctance to go in there that they didn't know whether it was a, going to be a beneficial act or not. That's possible. I have to confess to you. I mean, I'm somebody who has been involved in, in even electoral politics in the past uh, here in Chicago in particular. And uh, I know, you know, several congressmen from the Illinois uh, delegation. I should say I knew them. The uh, federal political establishment has become so detached, so impenetrable, so unintelligible. Uh, I recall, you know, calling people I had known uh, prior to their entering public life, much less becoming Congress people, and pleading with them uh, initially in 1999 during the 78-day, you know, aerial onslaught against Yugoslavia, and uh, not having phone calls re uh, returned, people pretending they didn't know who I was, you know, that sort of thing. So that uh, we could only speculate what's going on in the Congress, because certainly nobody is telling us. And nor are public officials on the federal level, probably even down to the uh, uh, local level, uh, any longer accountable, even in theory, uh, to the constituents that, uh, you know, uh, elect them. Uh, I can tell you this, of the 535 legislators in, in Washington, the 100 members of the Senate and 435 of the House, with the departure at the same time, at the end of the last term, of Ron Paul and Dennis Kucinich, there is effectively no voice in either House of Congress that opposes war. None. That's quite a startling statistic, given the high levels of anti-war sentiment in the country. Exactly. Is it just money that's able to operate that? That's correct. And there's no real countervailing force. There is not a mass constituency that will go out and vote for a third-party candidate based on the peace issue and the peace issue alone. You know, when some uh, you know, uh, tentative effort in that direction, 1996, 2000, with the Ralph Nader campaign came, only 2.5% of the people had the courage to vote, if not for him, if they didn't prefer him, vote against the two parties that are the two war parties. 2.5%. And, uh, you know, until we get a, an organized populace that says, we will not pay taxes, we will not vote, we will not do any number of things, we will abstain from whatever it takes to draw your attention to the fact that we are not going to continue to, to support a political system monopolized by two parties, both of whom are the beneficiaries of the merchants of death in terms of campaign contributions and contracts in their st respective states, and that we are going to uh, step away from the political process and make it known clear that why we're doing it, and it's on the question of war and peace. Does the example of South America give us hope? That's the one hope there is in the world. I mean, truthfully, you know, I did mention the Alba nations earlier and, uh, you know, particularly uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, Bolivia, but also Cuba and Nicaragua, who are members of Alba. One had expected better from, uh, you know, uh, El Salvador than what we've seen uh, in, in Latin America, but also the creation uh, maybe three, four years ago, of what's known uh, by the acronym of CELAC, uh, the community of uh, Latin American and Caribbean states, which is every nation in the Western Hemisphere, except for the 
United States and Canada, you know, suggests that the potential exists for true multipolarity, not only in the Western Hemisphere, but in the world. And, um, you know, Brazil being a member of the BRICS economic formation, uh, lending its the first letter of its name to the first letter in the acronym, of course, uh, you know, suggests the potential for that happening. But, uh, you know, one cannot overlook, uh, we have to remember that Brazil and India, at any rate, South Africa also, uh, I think, as, as coincidence may have had it, I, they could all have been uh, rotating, those three countries that have been rotating members of the Security Council in, in uh, 2011, when the vote was affected to uh, in, uh, affect a uh, no-fly zone over Libya, that is, the, uh, the in essence, the declaration of war against Libya, and that Russia and China abstained, and those other three countries either abstained or voted for it. So, you know, you can't separate out a multipolar economic and trade arrangement in the world and permit the U.S. Uh, you know, military behemoth to go around uh, you know, disrupting any part of the world it chooses to and not offer any resistance to it. The two are incompatible. What, let's take the uh, General Assembly vote on Crimea earlier this year. Only 12 countries voted against it, Tom, right? Only 12 countries voted against it. India abstained, Brazil ab ab abstained, South Africa abstained. You know, to say that the U.S. is isolated this is wishful thinking, and it's dangerously wishful thinking. You know, there has to be political transformation within countries as well as a new arrangement between countries before we can talk about, you know, the prospect for a peaceful, peaceful world. But to pretend that, you know, a corrupt leader overnight uh, turns out to be a nice guy, I mean, I just can't buy it. The world is kind of, it seems to be, you know, against the U.S. thing in, in, in Palestine, but on most other things, they just roll over. Well, we have to remember that, you know, with the... Destruction of the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact, and, and the destruction of Comic Con, right? Their economic arrangement, which is important. Uh, it, I always said this is the in gradations. This is where you're going to see something like after the defeat of Bonaparte with the, uh, you know, Holy Alliance, uh, you know, in Europe and so forth. You're going to see a period of the darkest reaction. I mean, anyone should have been able to predict this in 1991. You're going to see the darkest possible reaction, and anyone who had been even partially neutral is going to be hunted down, and killed. So what did you see? After the uh, socialist bloc breaks up, then they destroyed the non-aligned movement. The non-aligned movement is dead. It was one of the most powerful factors in the world uh, 30 years ago. Uh, that's why you had opposition to the U.S. It was the socialist bloc on one end, the non-aligned in the movement, and the U.S. and its NATO allies on the other side. Now, after they destroy the socialist bloc, they go after the non-aligned movement. They go after one after another after another. But I'm afraid that's predictable. That's exactly what I would have expected the West to do in a period where they had nobody to oppose. Them. Of course, they're going to go for the kill. Strategically, they can go for the kill. It can be the overkill sometimes and whiplash in their face. Well, that was, that was the argument of Chalmers Johnson and others, right? Imperial overreach. The U.S. was going to so thoroughly extend itself that it would collapse under its own weight. Well, that's been said for 20 years. Has it happened? No, it has not. You know, we have people who have been able to prepare for every contingency and have done it for 50 years. I mean, they have think tanks that are unbelievable. They have game theories. They have everything planned for every possible contingency. If this one goes wrong, we go here. If that goes wrong, we backtrack and we try another approach. But the bottom line is, you can make as many mistakes as you want to if no one's going to hold you accountable. Right, Iraq was a debacle, good. So what? We don't care. We'll move on to the next one, right? It seems like the, the, the Middle East is just being completely fractured at the moment. Yeah, have you seen the map that was put out by uh, uh, Ralph Peters maybe 15 years ago about the reconfigured Middle East? Uh, they discovered it at a NATO training facility in Italy. He's a former U.S. military person. And, uh, you know, it showed a greater Kurdistan, uh, uh, you know, two uh, uh, Saudi Arabia bifurcated, you know, several other countries reconfigured. Uh, yeah, this whole, you know, under the George uh, W. Bush administration, what was alternately known as the New Middle East, the Greater Middle East uh, Project's broader Middle East projects, uh, were to reconfigure the Islamic world from Mauritania to Kazakhstan. There's no question about it. And that, uh, you know, but we should also remember a lot of the Russian think tanks claim that U.S., uh, you know, geopoliticians are operating under concepts defined as creative destruction, controlled chaos. So oftentimes what appears to be an unintended consequence, you know, debacle, may not be, indeed, I mean, this may be something the U.S. had prepared for. It's like, it's not optimal, but it's certainly desirable. Yes, right. You know, I, I've learned to compare it over the last years. I, I refer to it as a um, global 30 years war. What the 30 years war was to the German states in the first instance, you know, uh, to reconfigure Europe after the Protestant Reformation, 
1648, with you know uh, 60 percent of the population destroyed, you know killed. Germany, German development set back 200 years and all that. Uh, this is happening now on a global scale. Look at Libya. Look at former Yugoslavia. Look at Syria. Look at Iraq. Look at Afghanistan. On and on and on. And Ukraine, Ukraine by the time it's over. So it seems like these states that were kind of strong crystalline structures that had, you know, had a certain amount of operability and maybe some types of independence that, that the idea is to either change the leadership and the control of those states or literally just to kind of smash them a bit. That's it. That's exactly my read. Now, we have to remember that particularly the Bush administration, the recent one, and this is exactly at the time of the NATO expansion, the color revolutions and the NATO expansion, which, by the way, went hand in glove. By 2003, 2004, Bush would be going to places like Riga, Latvia, or Tbilisi, Georgia. That is, the two countries where if you really wanted to get under Russia's skin, that's where you'd go. Really. You know, Latvia with its neo-Nazi leader and, and, and uh, Georgia with uh, Saakashvili. And he made speech after speech where he condemned the post-Yalta world. And by the way, this is roughly a paraphrase of Brzezinski. And what they meant was, you know, that uh, the West made too many concessions to Stalin at Yalta, and now it's time to change it. That is to redraw the maps of Europe uh, defined after World War II. And redraw them according to whom? Well, you can look at Europe now. It looks dangerously close to how Hitler and Mussolini uh, we, with, uh, redrew the map of Europe, especially in Southeast Europe. But, but let's, let's keep in mind that countries they've attacked are the post-World War II multi-ethnic, multi-denominational, multi-racial states. Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, Socialist Feder uh, Federal Republic of Yugoslavia, you know, attempts to do that in Syria and Iraq with Arab, uh, Kurdish, Assyrian, uh, Christian, Muslim, you know, any time there was, an I would argue the next ones, of course, are and probably already underway, uh, Egypt, Nigeria, Indonesia, and India. So the countries with, with easy fault lines... Yeah, yeah. But to destroy the very nature that a nation could be based on citizenry rather than race and religion. Yeah, it's quite a reactionary <laughs> notion. I mean, it's fascistic. And I have no question, you know, they're motivated by similar uh, thoughts that what you have is, you know, uh, nations based on blood and soil. You know, I'll just the best example I can give you, you know, during the uh, Gerald Ford administration and Brezhnev and Soviet Union, they signed the Helsinki Accord, you'll recall, right? And the final declaration says, I'm roughly paraphrasing it, that um, however deficient in many respects the redrawing of national borders after World War II is, it is preferable to the alternative, which is that of Hitler and Mussolini to redraw the borders, and you know, which ultimately, uh, you know, which uh, 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 ended up in a war that cost 50 million lives. There are 19 new states, and it says that the borders are uh, inviolable, right? You cannot violate the borders in Europe as defined after World War II, after Yalta and, and uh, Potsdam. There are 19 new countries in Europe. Since 1991, there are 19 new countries in Europe. So what happened to we're not going to trifle with national boundaries because it may result in another world war, <laughs> right? And, you know, and what, what perturbs me is the fact people don't pay attention to things like these. These are epochal, right? I mean, they're, they're watershed events. They're not, uh, you know, uh, minutia of interest only to, you know, history buffs or something. These are, these are major, major milestones, and, and people are completely indifferent to them. Yeah, I suppose they're not given the framework to understand them, I think. Yeah, it's a shame, though, Tom, it truly is, because, you know, by the time they get it, it's too late. I view the Russian non-response to developments in Ukraine as being even worse than capitulation. Even worse than capitulation. And the irony that they've made Putin into an aggressor in the, in the world image, when this man has tolerated things that if any other head of state would, I, I should hope they would try him for treason. He has allowed his territory to be shelled. He has allowed citizens within Russian territory to be killed. He has allowed checkpoints to be attacked. He, you know, I go on and on. He has treated Ukrainian government soldiers on Russian territory free and then allowed Ukrainian military aircraft to land on Russian soil to take them back to go back to war. This is on the Russian media, by the way. I mean, this is Russian media reporting. We have treated 100 and so Ukrainian troops. Uh, we're patching them up. We're treating them for free. Uh, Poroshenko sent an airplane to pick them up. They can go back and uh, assault the, the city of Donetsk, uh, you know, a town of a city of a million people. 
and uh, lay it under siege again. Yeah. You know, I remember somebody once uh, was, uh, they attributed the statement to Hegel. I don't know if he made it, but if he did, it's a smart one. You know, in Greek mythology, the owl, which is a night bird, was the symbol of uh, Pallas Athene, Minerva, you know, the goddess of wisdom. So the statement was by Hegel, the owl of Minerva only spreads its wings and flies at twilight. That is, we, o- we only become wise when it's too late. Thanks very much for coming on the show today, Rick. No, thank you for having me. I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak on the level that you and I were able to. I found my field on Blueberry Hill. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters by Sun Ra and his orchestra, and Dizzy Rascal trying to cut him off. You also heard Billy Holiday and Joy Division in isolation. And you are now listening to Vladimir Putin singing Blueberry Hill. Thanks for listening, and I hope you join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. To be, though we're apart, you part of me still. For you were my thrill on Blueberry Hill. Come plant with you with me, baby. We'll see what we shall see. I'll bring my own with me. I'll be with you when the is are blue. Each afternoon we'll go. Higher than the moon will go. Spend the way in June will go. Oh